Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Lee Kuntz, and I'm President and Artistic Director of the Gateways Music Festival. And I'm really delighted to welcome all of you here tonight. Um, I'm thrilled to see so many of our friends, um, our longtime supporters, some new friends, some musicians, um, members of our board, and many others. So thank you for joining us tonight. I know that uh, Zoom has become um, the, the go-to place for meetings these days, and, and it's easy to get tired of Zoom, but tonight has allowed us to bring together folks from all across the country. So we've got people on the call from um, Los Angeles, from Phoenix, from Chicago, and Rochester, New York City, and more. Um, so there are really some terrific advantages to using this particular platform. We are only a few weeks away from our, um, what seems like a long awaited 2022 Gateways Music Festival. Um, it will be our first dual festival in two cities in, in Rochester, New York and in New York City um, with nearly 20 performances and events in Rochester, New York, um, culminating in the Gateways Orchestra's uh, Carnegie Hall debut, which is now sold out. Um, this 2022 festival is a tremendous um, milestone for our organization. And all of this is possible um, because of the support of many of you on this call. So before anything, I'd like to just say thank you for that. Um, as a housekeeping note, um, before we um, go into the introductions, I'd like to make sure that everybody knows that um, or is, is muted um, while the interview is taking place. Um, and there will be an opportunity toward the end of the program for you to interact and ask, ask questions of Anthony and Alex. And you can also put questions in the chat. Um, and I and Max will be monitoring the chat. So we're really thrilled that Alex, um, Alexander Lang and Anthony Parther are joining us this morning. Anthony, uh, Al Alex is the principal clarinet of the Phoenix Symphony Orchestra or the Phoenix Symphony. He's also the principal clarinet of the Gateways Orchestra. Um, he's chair of the Gateways Artistic Programs Committee and vice chair of our board of directors. So he wears many hats at Gateways. Alex is a nationally recognized speaker and he's a thought leader and an, uh, an accomplished instrumentalist um, whose work represents a modern take on orchest orchestral practice. Um, Alex is active as a performing artist and as an artist who teaches. He is passionate and curious about organizational culture, design and learning. He navigates, um, he, his practice navigates the push and pull between the tradition of a legacy art form and its unfixed future. Alex is, is a musician who believes that music is not just sound, it is sounds and words and people. Alex, thank you for joining us tonight. And Anthony Parther um, is our uh, new conductor for the Gateways Orchestra. Um, and he is the music director and conductor of the San Bernardino Symphony um, and the Southeast Symphony and Chorus, both in Los Angeles. Anthony's career includes conducting engagements with major orchestras around the world and hundreds of Hollywood film and television series, including Star Wars, The Mandalorian, and now I can say the new Academy Award winning Encanto, yes, is that correct? <laughs> Terrific, congratulations. Um, Anthony will conduct the Gateways Orchestra's Rochester and New York City concerts. Um, and it's important for us, for me to say that he was um, the, the, the musicians of the Artistic Programs Committee. Um, he was the top choice to conduct these concerts after the untimely passing of our music director, our beloved music director, Michael Morgan. Um, we are thrilled to have Anthony leading us during this upcoming festival and really grateful to have you here tonight, Anthony. So thank you very much. Uh, I've really been looking forward to tonight. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you for having You're me. You're welcome. And so without any further delay, um, I'd like to introduce um, Alex who will lead us through this uh, really important and fun um, interview. Alex. Sure, well, thank you, Lee. And, and thanks to everyone for joining us. I just want to echo uh, what Lee said about um, how, how wonderful it is to, to have Anthony, um, despite the circumstances uh, that brought uh, us together. It's, it's really been exciting getting to know Anthony. I'm excited for the community with us tonight to get to know Anthony a little bit better. So um, 
One, you know, I have a, a bunch of questions, as you can imagine, Anthony, but I think it probably would be best to, uh, to, to do as the sound of music tells us to do and start at the very beginning for those who don't know you as well. So can you just tell us a little bit about your early life and uh, how you got started in music? Sure. Well, you know, I'm the son of two immigrants, so I'm first generation American. My father was born in 1929 in South Lamar, Jamaica, and he immigrated to the United States in 1949 and fought in the Korean War to get his citizenship. And my mother came from Samoa in 1960. Um, so I didn't understand what anybody was saying at the breakfast table. But uh, it was um, uh, my formative years were I came to music, classical music, pretty late in comparison to most people. I started uh, playing the bassoon around the ninth grade. Um, I, <laughs> I uh, was obsessed with two things growing up, and that was Star Wars and theme parks. And, uh, you know, I, I desperately wanted to go in Virginia anyways, which is where I grew up. Um, I, there's a theme park called King's Dominion, which is a paramount, uh, which is a paramount park. And um, <laughs> we you know, did not have the resources. My parents did not have the resources or the interest to go to a theme, you know, to ride roller coasters all day. But um, I remember very specifically in the eighth grade hearing over the intercom what all of the students in the Linkhorn Middle School Band report to the buses for their trip to King's Dominion. And about three, you know, about three quarters of the class stood up, they grabbed all these crazy looking instrument cases and bound out the door, leaving the rest of us behind. And I was thinking, mm hmm, I think we're on to something here. So I, I uh, went home that day and plotted my way into the band program. I started off in the band program as, a, as an instrumentalist and I opened the dictionary to the A section of the dictionary and I saw the accordion. Now I remember my folks, for whatever reason, they used to love to watch Arthur Duncan. For those of you who remember who Arthur Duncan was, Arthur Duncan was a tap dancer and he would always appear on the Lawrence Welk show. And they, you know, we really had no business, I mean, uh, watching, you know, the Lawrence Welk show, but they wanted to see Arthur Duncan tap dance on that piano. Um, but I just thought that the accordion seemed like the least cool instrument ever. So I pulled over to the B section of the dictionary and saw the bassoon. And I was like, that is the instrument that will earn me the respect of my peers, the bassoon. So I took the, the my little dictionary to Mr. David Webb, God bless his heart. And I said, my name is Anthony Parthen. I want to play the bassoon, you know? <laughs> and, and that's literally how it started. I, I learned the bassoon um, over the summer and I showed up to ninth grade band uh, the next year, holding it between my feet in a vertical position. I didn't know that that's, you know, I, we're talking about as green as one could possibly be. But that's literally how I got my start in music. Wow, I love that story. Uh, just for color, I uh, I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside DC. Oh so yeah, King's Dominion. Yeah. We would we would pass King's Dominion uh, on ninety five, going to visit my my grandparents who lived in Virginia. So I, yes, I looked longingly at uh, at King's Dominion. Uh, I, I know that feeling very well. Absolutely, I love the story of you holding the bassoon between your leg, your your feet. Reminds me of my first time with the clarinet. You know, I no one. I had played the recorder, so anyway, I put it, I had to read on top until <laughs> until I got to my first lesson. So there's that. Um, okay, so what what comes next, right? You've got the bassoon. You got your music dictionary. You've got it. Sounds like a dedicated and passionate. Uh, initial band director, which I know is a critical part in so many people's stories, but but tell me, and I'm so excited to hear what it was like for you when we get a little farther into the story, when this young man who grew up loving Star Wars, you know, ends up playing this important role in this iconic franchise. But before we get to that, there's, there feels like there's a little bit more story to be told. So so help help me understand what comes next. You know, what happens? How does high school go? What happens after high school? Well, the important thing to uh, realize is that all of my friends who were in the band uh, were so excited that next year they were supposed to play Star Wars and go back to King's Dominion. And I will tell you that they did not play Star Wars the next year and they did not go back to King's Dominion. In fact, I sit here still having never been to King's Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> so I overcompensated by becoming a full-time orchestra conductor. No, I, I uh, you know, I, the thing that I think that I 
really didn't quite understand or grasp when I was getting, cause you know, I, I got into this and employed to try to, to go to a theme park. But what I realized is when I showed up to band camp, there was 250 other musicians. And then, you know, we were being sent off to various, you know, sections and so forth. Um, but it was kind of like, I think uh, one of the things that I really loved about the communal music making um, was the sense of family immediately. You know, I was like, you know, cause I'm an only child and um and really kind of had an isolated experience growing up but immediately i had this family of 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 people and we were all doing this strength you know we're out here in the hot sun i had to also the you apparently you do not march the bassoon in in band especially in the south where band is a big thing um you march during the fall and then you do concert band during the spring but you do not play the bassoon and marching band so they handed me a clarinet so i had to you know i just barely learned to play the bassoon so now i have to at band camp learn yet another instrument um but uh, so i was a multi-instrumentalist after three months of intense summer study <laughs> uh but uh, i love the sense of community I love the sense of community and, and so many different people from different walks of life uh, with different instruments that didn't look alike or sound alike. But, um, but I love the idea that we were all uh, working towards the same goal. And I thought that was, that was really beautiful. And what I also began to realize that I, I went to high school that had a really good band program, you know, uh, and, you know, because I was one of only two bassoon players in this really quite large band program, I was put into the top wind ensemble. So here we are, like, I remember the very first thing we, they pull out is Lincoln Shire Posey, which is a piece by this Australian composer named uh, Percy Granger. And I, you know, this music was so far beyond, you know, my little Rubank, you know, elementary method book that, <laughs> that I'd, been, I'd been studying. So I had to really, because the top wind ensemble this, at this school was, was playing really sophisticated literature. So I had to get good at this thing really quickly, you know? Um, so yeah, so I, I, I got, I, I worked really, really hard. Yeah, tell, so 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 let's just tell me a little more about that in terms of so you're working hard, um, you know it's it's interesting uh, you know by many sort of by most by many I would say certainly pro now professional so-called classical musician uh, instrumentalist stories ninth grade is is a late start um, thrown in the deep end it sounds like that was a good thing right you just have to run fast to keep up with it sounds like a really good herd of folks. Um, do, so did you go on to major in music in college? Did you, you know, what role does music play after you leave high school? Well, I, um, I became pretty serious about the bassoon. Um, my first bassoon teacher was a lady named Julia Miller and I, I have fallen out of contact with her. I've tried to find her. I have no idea if she even knows that I still play the instrument, much less of, you know, played it at the level that I have and continue to, but she was a lady who worked at the post office. You know, she taught me, you know, I would take my little bassoon over to her house in, in Jefferson in Forest, Virginia. And and uh, when I heard her play, I was like, oh, my goodness, that is the sound. You know, I, I, I still have her sound memorized all these years later. Uh, but I decided I wanted to play bassoon in an orchestra. And by that time, I was taking lessons with a more of a serious teacher uh, who was teaching me for free because, I mean, we didn't have the money for lessons. Um, but I remember he told me that I needed to go to a school that was near one of the big orchestras. Um, you know, one of the big, he called them the big five. So I think we still refer them to, you know, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Chicago. Uh, did I, who did I leave out? I think That's I got it. everybody. Yep. So I ended up going, I ended up, ended up going to school uh, in Evanston, Illinois, Chicago. I think we share that in common. We do, um, go on. But, uh, and then, uh, you know, so I got to study with uh, with members of the Chicago Symphony bassoon section, um, mm. which was which was intimidating, but amazing. Wow, 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 wow. Um, all right. So just quickly, just because I'm curious, what was your what had you experienced winter before you before you <laughs> were out right there at, at Regenstein with the wind, with the hot coming in off the lake? <laughs> 
I, re I just remember, you know, because I wasn't, I wasn't, I couldn't afford to live on campus, and they made a special mm -hmm. commendation for me. So I remember having to take my contrabass <laughs> all the way uh, to Elliott Avenue, and mm -hmm. um, I just remember it would be so cold that you could spit, and it would be frozen before it got to the sidewalk. You know, when yeah. that wind hit yeah. the, you know, Lake Michigan, it was just over. It was exactly hideous, hideous winters. Yes, and yes, I will, yes. I will never experience that again. Yeah. <laughs> it gets can, a, a I, nice cold balmy 68 here in los angeles and it, that's as far as i'll go wow um well jumping ahead after you finished your undergraduate studies at northwestern you went on and continued your studies at yale university so quite a pedigree so um i know there at yale you studied orchestral conducting with lawrence layton smith and otto Werner mueller and um can you tell us when was it while you were at Northwestern that you thought you you how did how did you discover conducting? I know you discovered the bassoon. Tell us a little bit about how you just or maybe conducting discovered you. I'd love to hear that story. Well, I always wanted to be the high school drum major, which is the person who stands in front of the marching band and conducts. And I auditioned for it every year and never got it. <laughs> um, but I was I, I was always fascinated with uh, with conducting, and I uh, I think maybe by my sophomore junior year of undergrad, I started to put together little groups. Um, mm. Together, I remember I put together a group for my my junior recital um, that I conducted and played, and mm. you know the the. You know, some of my my friends, you know, pretty critical. You know, that you should think about doing this. Was we this was you know a lot of fun. Um, so so I was pretty audacious, and I put together a huge group of people. And you know, at the time I was playing bassoon in the Civic Orchestra of Chicago, so mm -hmm. I got a bunch of Civic folks, a bunch of people from DePaul, a couple of my friends from Roosevelt, a couple of people who were freelancers who had just left school, and uh, and some folks who were also at Northwestern. I put together this huge orchestra. Orchestra, and uh, and I submitted the Rite of Spring as my uh, audition tape to uh, to grad school. The thing is, is that um, I was already in towering debt after Northwestern, and I had to go somewhere that was free. And Yale, if you get into the at that time, it was kind of early on in the in, at the time. But um, if you got into the uh, master's program, it was a, it was a fellowship, you know. So you know, <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking, gosh, I need to go somewhere free. I wasn't thinking necessarily. You know all the, you know all the other, you know. So, uh, so did you apply to Yale? But you applied to Yale as, as a conducting fellow, not a bassoon fellow. Or yes, I, I conducted as a. I I I applied for for grad school for conducting. So both of your teachers at Yale, and I, 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 I for those on the call who don't know, these are sort of towering names or towering personalities uh, in the business. Um, many of the people on the call know. Who, can you tell us what, what what were you aware? Did you know you know who who these gentlemen were, what they meant in the field, um, and do you have anything you can share with us about what that was like? I mean, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I, I remember um, looking. I remember looking uh, at the bios of a number of conductors that uh, I really had a lot of respect. Working conductors, I noticed that almost all of them had trained with Otto Werner Mueller. <laughs> So I remember I had a friend who was at the, who was studying at Curtis, and um, I was he, he had invited me to come and see. They were performing at Kimmel Hall, I think, which they call, they call it the Verizon Theater now. Um, but uh, they were doing Mahler Three with the Maestro, and uh, and he said that he could get me an audience with the Maestro. So I'm I, you know I felt reluctant about telling this story, but I'm going to go ahead and tell everybody because we're amongst friends and family. Just don't repeat this. Well, he's no longer with us. But um, I had heard from a number of people that Otto Werner Mueller was quite intimidating. He was very strict. He was very unforgiving. And, you know, I just heard that he was a, he was quite a, quite a force to be reckoned with. And uh, he was very old school. So anyways, I went and saw the Curtis Symphony Orchestra perform Mahler III. He did the entire thing from memory which was remarkable. And of course the place was completely packed. And uh, so I went to the side door, they had my name and I, you know, so he's of course still, you know, giving recognition to the orchestra and the various soloists and so forth. And then I began to realize that from the, I was looking at Maestro through the little glass mirror that the, the Maestro, when he stood up off of his stool, <laughs> 
he was like, he was, uh, and I think he was about between six, six and six, seven. He was a very, very large man. And he, he turned and he's, you know, I could see him work, working his way, you know, towards the side door. And I began to get very nervous. I was like, oh my goodness, have mercy. Here he comes. It was kind of like seeing a Tyrannosaurus Rex working his way towards that side door. And as soon as he, and I, I just want to remind you that I am quoting the maestro. These are not my words. These are his. Um, as soon as he, he bursts through the door and he takes up the entire door frame and his head like literally comes out over the thing. And as soon as he gets within earshot of everybody, he says, I could have broke my fucking neck on that wire, that wire, you know, and he, I, I could have broke my neck. On that, you know, so mind you that the maestro tripped on this wire two hours ago, conducted all of Mahler three, and the only thing he thought about the entire time is that he tripped on a wire. And I was immediately terrified. And so, anyways, as so then he turns around, he goes back out to give the second round of applause. And I am shook, you know, and everybody's like scrambling around trying to make the maestro happy and, you know, either move the wire or whatever it was. And, you know, um, <laughs> so he comes back and the personnel manager, uh, who was, I think, Richard Oakley back in those days, was pushing me towards the door and I'm like terrified to go. So anyway, so he comes back in and in this time when he opens the door, he says, I could have broke my neck on that, you know, so he is continuing to go on about this, you know, so I, I was very, I was very terrified. I, I decided I, to scram out of there and he, you know, uh, so anyways, I ended up at, uh, at Yale with Lawrence Layton Smith, who was an amazing pianist. He had a real encyclopedic knowledge of the, of the vast terrain of music, you know, whether it's modern music or, or what have you. But Lawrence, I was actually one of his last conducting students. He became quite ill and then had to retire. So it was very interesting. They said, uh, I remember I was called into the department chair's office and she said, I am very excited to announce to you that you will be studying with Otto Werner Mueller next year. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about him bursting through the door and, and yelling about that wire for 30 minutes. Um, but, uh, you know, Otto Werner Mueller was very different. He had an encyclopedic knowledge, but he had an encyclopedic knowledge of the, you know, sort of the core repertoire. I mean, so you really got very familiar with all the nine Beethoven symphonies, all the Schumann, the Brahms. I mean, so he was deeply, deeply, deeply steeped uh, in that tradition. He was not interested in a lot of new music. He was not interested in, you know, a hogwash, you know, this is, you know, yeah. So anyways, very, very different personalities. Um, but I learned an immense amount uh, from both of them in different ways. You know, it's interesting that you would touch there on the sort of um, deep and, and narrow specialty of uh, Maestro Werner Mueller. Uh, of course, your, your career looks somewhat different, right? So as some of our guests might know, um, you conduct across a range of uh, different types of music with different types of performers, including Joshua Bell and Jesse Norman, Jennifer Holliday, Kanye West, Imagine Dragons, and leaving aside the Hollywood stuff, which the, the film stuff, which we're gonna get into in a second, but just for live, live music performances, you know, you show up in a lot of different spaces. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about um, what some of the challenges are with that, also what excites you about that, and maybe if there's any uh, delicious little stories you might want to share about that in any regard, either what it's like sort of doing what you do, which is, I think, uh, switching on a dime, you know, one week this and the next week that, or maybe something that happened in a performance. But if you could just sort of unpack that a little bit for us and help us understand how it is that in that regard, at least the apple has fallen so far from the, the tree, the conducting tree, such as it is. Well, I think Mueller would be horrified if he knew that I was uh, engaging in all <laughs> because <laughs> he was so steeped in, in traditionalism. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I love putting on a good show, uh, regardless of who the composer is. Um, I love, uh, I love entertaining. Um, I love, uh, you know, and I also love opportunities for, uh, for musicians that I'm working with to make a living, you know? So, you know, I remember it was like five o'clock in the morning and I get a call from, uh, from Ernie Fields, who's a contractor in town. He says, Rihanna wants a 50 piece black orchestra uh, by tomorrow for a recording session. And, you know, <laughs> so, 
here I am putting together, uh, you know, this black orchestra for Rihanna at, you know, six o'clock in the morning, have to, uh, you know, and, and she had very specific uh, aesthetics that she was looking for, which made the call even more challenging. Um, so, uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of these calls, whether it be from, you know, Snoop Dogg or Kanye West about, um, because I've kind of become known in Hollywood as that black guy who does classical music. Um, so, uh, so it's been, you know, and then Rihanna gave my name to Beyonce, you know, so it's, it's been, I've been passed around, uh, to numerous genres outside of the classical industry, um, uh, constantly and, and even still to this day. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I've got all, all kinds of crazy stories, you know, uh, uh, again, many may not be uh, befitting this particular, the dignity of today's oc uh, occasion, uh, but, you know, perhaps, you know, after no a, a martini no at the concert, we can, <laughs> we can discuss in greater detail, but, uh, but it's, it's, the, the thing is, is that, you know, I'm a musician first and then the circumstance kind of comes secondary, um, a musician first and then bassoon or conducting or arranging or what have you, or, or all sort of secondary. And, uh, and, you know, it's not necessarily classical music that I'm uh, so infatuated with. I'm, I'm obsessed with the orchestra itself as an organism, kind of going back to my early experiences in the, in the high school band. I just, the combination of these instruments and people and the sound that, an or, that only an orchestra uh, can produce, regardless of the genre, is what I'm particularly curious about and, and excited about. Mm. That's so fascinating, and, and yes, I think uh, over over uh, any number of different kinds of drinks, I would love to hear more about that. I think we all would. But recognizing that we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't hover on everything. Um, I'd love to spend some time now just talking a little bit about about Hollywood, where you're very active. Your, I think your 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 film credits as a conductor uh, and uh, as a player are, you know. Uh, probably closer to a thousand uh, or maybe per, 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 perhaps be beyond that at this point. Um, so, you know, so just for those of who don't know, so um, Maestro Parther has uh, led the Hollywood Studio Symphony in recording sessions for feature films like Star Wars, The Mandalorian, and Star Wars, The Book of Boba Fett, uh, Fargo, The Way Back, Disney's Encanto. Uh, congratulations as well, just for the recent events in that regard. Um, so can you just tell us, like, how did that happen? And, and, and what's that like? And um, yeah, we'll just start with that. You know, what, how, how did that come to be? And um, did, you, did you move to LA with that mindset? Or, or how did it unfold? Yeah, I, I moved to LA 15 years ago, specifically to uh, try to get an opportunity um, to work on film music. Uh, because, you know, John Williams was my obsession. Uh, growing up, and I thought if one day, if I could play just one whole note uh, for John Williams, then, then my life would, you know, <laughs> thankfully, I've, I've played more than a whole note for John Williams. Um, but, uh, you know, the Hollywood Studio Symphony itself is quite a special uh, organization. There's no auditions to get in, um, you know, and this is the orchestra that has played on countless, you know, films for the last almost 100 years. Um, but you look into like the violin section and what you might see, if you see 40 violins sitting there, 38 of them are concert masters of big orchestras or were concert masters of big orchestras or people who have had major solo careers. So it's kind of like the Hollywood Studio Symphony is kind of like an all-star kind of group. You look into the cello section and like sitting 12th cello is the former principal uh, cellist of the London Philharmonic, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, um, so the level in there is staggeringly high. Uh, we move very, very fast. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's a completely different environment in a lot of ways, because um, oftentimes in, in a live scenario, I'm working on music where the composer is not in the room, but uh, in the case of, you know, scoring orchestras, the composer is always in the room. Um, and it's my job to run the session and oftentimes to be, you know, have to be prepared to reorchestrate uh, on the stand and, uh, you know, like Encanto, for instance, you know, that is a, Jermaine Franco is a composer I've conducted for for quite a long time and she and I have quite a system, but uh, I will reorchestrate or reconform things on the spot. So you really, it's a completely different set of, uh, of skills because you're not necessarily sitting around reorchestrating Tchaikovsky or Brahms. They did a pretty good job. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, for music that's being written on the fly, a lot of the ink isn't even dry on, on, on music because this is all in post-production. You know, you get a film in lock and then you have about six to eight weeks to write a score. And then as soon as that's done, you have a week, sometimes two weeks to record the score. Um, so th this music is very fresh. It might be orchestrated by God only knows whom. 
and uh, you know, so you, it's it's a, a really fast uh, paced environment, and you have to be prepared for anything, you know, really. Mm, mm. All right. Well, recognizing that there's a lot of folks here that I think are eager to talk to you themselves, I'm just going to uh, shift gears and talk about uh, your next. Uh, uh, one of your next projects, which I'm, of course, and everyone on this call is particularly excited about, which is your work with the Gateways Festival Orchestra uh, and our upcoming appearances at Carnegie. And um, let me just clear the decks a little bit and let you talk a little bit. We've, I'll just reiterate again, you know, um, Michael Morgan's passing was unexpected and, and, and a tragic blow for the festival. Um, it helped absorbing that when we um, were able to connect with you and realize that we really did have, and let me also say that respectfully, there are a lot of great black conductors, more than we even knew actually, and we thought we knew a lot. And yet and still, it was clear to to the to those of us involved that you, know, you, you were really the, the right person for this moment. And we were so pleased that you were available and also interested. But if you could talk a little bit about what you're looking forward to with this upcoming Gateways residency, what it means for you to be conducting this orchestra at this important moment in its history. So anything that, that you're feeling or thinking in that regard, I'm sure our guests would love to hear about that. Of course. Well, uh, there is no replacement for Michael Morgan. He's a towering okay. figure in the industry, regardless of any other circumstances. Um, Schulte could have chosen, a, he had his hand pick, pick of the best conductors in the world, but he chose Michael Morgan because he saw something very special in him uh, to become the associate conductor of the Chicago Symphony. Uh, my time at Northwestern uh, was beginning as Michael Morgan's um, tenure was, you know, ending. And um, so he's somebody that I've known for a very, very long time. I didn't, you know, get to really connect with him until probably the early 2000s. I want to say maybe 2005, 2006 is when I actually got to know him a lot better. And in the last few years, I mean, there were... <laughs> <laughs> I would say that our late night Facebook chat should probably be burned uh, <laughs> because of, uh, let's just say that we probably served a, a few uh, lightly grilled reputations. Um, but, you know, you know, a lot of times we, we, we had we had so much in common and I would always go to him with questions about uh, he, he always had a lot of sage wisdom uh, for me because there's there's really no circumstances, I don't think, that. Um, that I have been through that Michael Morgan hasn't as a black conductor working in this country and abroad, quite frankly. Um, so there is no replacement for Michael Morgan, but I certainly will give my all. Um, as far as, you know, the importance of, of me getting the opportunity to work with, with Gateways, um, there's so many different layers to that. I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I'm going to paint a, a, a wide brush that when we're talking about black classical musicians working professionally at the professional level um, here in the United States, uh, these are not rooms that are dominated by people that look like us, you know, so, um, so the opportunity for so many people of 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 skill and you you and you 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 led with something that's very important because there's this myth that there aren't many qualified black conductors or black classical musicians but there are i mean i could list you know 25 or 30 really excellent black conductors that i know personally i mean we have our own little <laughs> we have our own little chat um but you know uh, but there there's so many there's so many um and uh, and, and there are so many, uh, you know, we have enough, I mean, you know, I conduct the Southeast Symphony here in Los Angeles, which is the oldest predominantly black orchestra in the world. We're, you know, 75 years old. Um, but, you know, we did a mall or two with, you know, 90 black musicians, you know, so it's, uh, you know, so that's a, that's a myth. But the thing is, is that Gateways, or, organiza an organization like G Gateways dispels the myth that there are aren't enough black musicians and it dispels the myth that there aren't enough qualified professional level uh, musicians um, of color working. Uh, and, and the thing is that, you know, gateways, I can only imagine that the database must be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and, you know, I don't even know, uh, you know, but you're picking from the top, you know, hundred of the people that you have at your availability. So, um, but the, the thing is, is that this is a safe space for all of us to make music, you know, because culturally speaking, we are 
just as uh, in any other cultural, uh, you know, different different people who identify culturally different. Um, but we're, we, you know, we have to button up a lot of uh, of who we are to operate in spaces that uh, in in spaces where a lot of the people there do not look like us. And this is a place where we can all take a, a big breath and focus on the music making. We don't have to focus on anything else except for making music at an extraordinarily high level. No other agendas than that. And and for that, I'm extraordinarily excited. Oh, that's that's really wonderful. Um, yeah, I'll share for myself, you know, uh, um, first time I played in the Gateways Festival uh, in the Gateways Orchestra was in 2001. And uh, I think it, sometime during the, the festival we were playing, we, we played a number of stuff, but we also, we played Beethoven, which, you know, has lots of challenges for, I was playing principal, has lots of challenges for the principal wins. So on the one hand, it's kind of normal, right? This is what I do. I'm trying to meet these challenges and coordinate with this. And then on the other hand, every time I sort of got my head out of my part and look around and I see an entire stage filled with black people and I see Michael Morgan on the podium and it just would kind of scramble my mind a little bit. I remember on the flight home trying to process like what just happened? And one of my, it still rings, I've told the story many times, so forgive if you've heard it before, but it really gave me pause to think about like what is it that I have come to think of as normal such that this experience had sort of scrambled my mind so much, right? And it really caused me to start to look critically at um, what I had sort of given up in some regards or, or felt that I had to give up. Some of the stuff you described that first attracted you to the business, that sense of being a part of something bigger than yourself. And I understand that some of those feelings don't translate to the professional ranks. I don't care what creed, color, shape, size, whatever, because you know, being in high school is different than being a grown up with responsibilities. But yeah, that 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 um, that was just the, the beginning of a, of a long sort of line of inquiry for myself in terms of like what 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 makes this experience meaningful and why, and does it translate beyond just myself? How does it become more meaningful for the audience? And what role do the people making the music have in in the experience of the music? Um, what we're going to do now is uh, with Lee's assistance, hopefully, or maybe Max. I'm not sure, but if we could if we could start to uh, bring in some questions from our friends who have taken time out of their busy lives to spend some time with Anthony. I'm sure they are uh, brimming with questions. I haven't been following the chat, so um, Lee, let me know what, what I need to do in this regard. Or if you want to queue one up, that'd be great. And Lee, you're muted, buddy. Friend, sorry. L Lee, you're muted. Thank you. I thought I'd unmute it. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, and maybe Max can help out on this as well. Um, there's there's a question here that says, um, Mr. Parther, you have had various learning opportunities from great musicians and teachers. Um, what did you bring to them that was absolutely you? Well, I remember um, asking uh, Otto Werner Mueller if he... <laughs> <laughs> Goodness of mercy. Um, uh, I had just discovered who Florence Price was. Hmm. You know, so, uh, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know if he did, know, but he was just so uh, uh, not interested in any, I think regardless of sex or color, just anybody who wasn't in the core repertoire, it was a, it was a waste of time and venture for you to not be dedicating your time to the the you know this very dogmatic list of composers in which you need to be memorizing every single thing about um so i i think that that's i think the exploration the early exploration into composers who looked like me and probably had similar life experiences as me um was was something that i kept bringing it back to them and so forth and i said i've got some you know we have some manuscripts here of a tone poem, you know, this, this could be, this could really turn into something. So I remember one of the, one of the first things that I did was uh, I restored a, a tone poem of hers, which I actually didn't get to a premiere until about four or five years ago. Um, but, uh, so, I mean, I guess that's probably one thing. I mean, there's, there's other things that are, that are smaller, but you know, it was like, okay, well, I've learned your repertoire, but I, I want to learn my repertoire. Mm. Mm. 
And I don't know, Lee, if the raised, uh, we can't see, we can only see each other. So I can't see the, our, our friends. I don't know if the raise hand feature might work or wait, we just have something in the chat. I just, now I have the chat open now. Can you see? So okay. yeah, I can. Uh, this is a great question from Ariel Davis. Uh, the question is, is what role, if any, would you like to see HBCUs, historically black college and universities playing in pushing forward on the cultural legacy of black classical musicians and conductors? So if you, yeah, please, I'll just listen. Yeah, sure. Well, there's, um, there is the, you know, it depends on how you, what lens you view, I guess, classical, like, you know, you know, we can dissect this from a number of, of ways. You know, my involvement in what we do is, in my opinion, and I have a very narrow opinion about this, quite honestly, is that it's a reclamation of something that we've created. I feel black people created what we have, what we consider classical music. And I'll tell you how, every single instrument in the orchestra was developed in Africa. I mean, if you take a look at the through, the through line of just like the violin, that was a one stringed instrument that emanated in Somalia that we called the ektar. And then it went up the Nile uh, to, to Mesopotamia. It got two strings and it, was called, it became the dotar. Then it went to India in the east, got three strings called the sitar. Then it moved back uh, to uh, the Middle East and became the quatar, four strings. And then eventually in the, in the 13th century, ended up in Europe and became the violin. Somebody put horse hair on it. Of course, by the time this instrument got to America, we electrocuted it because that's American culture and it became the electric guitar. But, um, you know, communal music making began began in Africa, um, you know, now, of course, you know, this, you know, in the long view, in the long lens, the very wide lens, you know, this has been, this musical form has been tweaked by, you know, Brahms, Beethoven, Mozart, and, and so forth, but communal mu music making with instruments that did not look like each other began in Africa. Um, so as far as what can HBCUs, what role can HBCUs play? Well, HBCUs have contributed to classical music uh, in so many important ways. You know, my dad taught at Norfolk State University in, uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. Yeah, he was not in the music department, of course. Um, but, uh, the, you know, the, of course, in we, some of the best singers in the world have come out of the, you know, the, the vocal studios of, of HBCUs and some of the greatest, uh, I mean, we've, we've produced so many wonderful uh, musicians who are, you know, in the, in, in, you know, working today that came out of HBCU. HBCUs do not typically have uh, the, have not concentrated a, a tremendous amount of effort into the symphony orchestra. Um, but if, if, if they decided that they wanted to concentrate their effort into the, uh, into the symphony orchestra, then, you know, then we've got a responsibility to try to support that, should that be the case. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think it's, I think it just, I think that's up to the HBCUs to decide uh, if it's important enough for them to focus their energies and resources on that. Um, as far as black classical musicians and conductors, um, uh, I don't know. There's, I think there's so many different ways that we can, we can go about doing this. I have a lot of thoughts about how the, how orchestras can survive and thrive in the future, but it would, it would deal with dismantling completely, uh, how we run, uh, orchestras to, you know, so that could be a whole different discussion. You know, I hate to, you know, cancel a really, uh, uh, interesting bottle of worms, but that's a whole different, uh, I think that classical music or the symphony orchestra itself, the professional symphony orchestra, uh, there are different ways for it to be structured in order for it to be relevant and also mm -hmm. for it to be a place, uh, that is a, a more, more just, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I would love to, it sounds like we have to have, uh, have to do this again, just to have that conversation. Um, cause I agree. That's a fascinating conversation. Another, uh, okay. There was a thank you there from, from Ariel Des. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. Um, I'll look for other questions in the chat, but in the meet, oh, here's Jesse. Oh, so th this is uh, an invitation to expound a little bit. One, this is from Jesse Rosen asking if you could elaborate on how you would restructure the orchestra. So if you were given the magic wand, not the baton, but uh, an actual magic wand, what would, uh, what might you do in that regard? Uh, there, I have a lot to say about that. Um, let's, well, he, well, let's just talk about this auditions. Um, you know, he, here is the thing. I'll, I'll just go ahead and say this, you know, I get to hire 23 musicians 
uh, and with the San Bernardino Symphony, which is an orchestra that has a, a about a 12 week season. Um, I certainly don't want it to be any more than that because I wouldn't be able to do anything else. But um, but, you know, we have about a 12 week season, but it's the fourth oldest orchestra in the state of California. Um, and it's in the it's in the low seven digit budget, you know, area. Um, however, um, here's the thing. Auditions, the only thing that auditions prove is a candidate's ability to play a particular excerpt very well. Now, I can say this having having conducted many of the great American orchestras that and this is not a fact, this is not a, a mystery, but to, symphony orchestras are some of the most toxic workplaces conceivably anywhere. They're incredibly toxic workplaces. And just because somebody has the skill to play uh, an excerpt from, you know, uh, you know, a Mozart symphony does not mean that they have all of the other skills needed to be a successful musician, such as, you know, uh, you know, so first of all, I would definitely, one of the things that I definitely would do and what I want to do with my own orchestra is to restructure the audition process. And basically I, I want for the music director in consultation with my personnel manager and with the orchestra committee to have the power to appoint a musician as a probationary member. Now, if this mu musician is able to uh, to do their services within you know within a two season uh, time period where they've showed that they can be a great colleague, that they can add to uh, you know the education and outreach of an organization and so forth, that they are a great player because you know some of the greatest players that I know are not great auditioners and they're sitting on, on couches and some of the most lacking musicians and worst colleagues that I know are aces at auditions. Auditions really only focus on a very specific, uh, you know, level of ability. And um, so, um, so when we talk about the diversification, you know, because, you know, for, uh, Blacks are underwhelmingly, I mean, you know, almost non-existent in, in most uh, professional symphony orchestras. But I think that with, with this particular system, I will have the opportunity to, to, to uh, diversify my orchestra and to have an orchestra that is a reflection of the community that it serves. Okay, mm -hmm. because you look at San Bernardino's population, it is they're not all white. <laughs> In fact, it's a very diverse population. One of the first things that I did when I got to San Bernardino Symphony is I had a meeting with 80 black doctors, lawyers, business owners, educators and things along those lines and had a very upfront conversation about. Uh, first of all, have any of you been to see the San Bernardino Symphony out of 80 hands, three people? Um, and well, what could this orchestra do to be more relevant to you, to be more interesting to you? So it was a, it was very interesting to hear uh, what that community of people had to say. And again, that we could spend a lot of time on that. But uh, anyways, um, so that is just like one small little thing that I think uh, that we could, you know, and it gives the orchestra and the conductor the opportunity to uh, to reach out and find a great candidate um, that that brings even that brings more than just music, but they bring citizenship and camaraderie and ideas. Uh, you know, we've got to have more diverse people, more diverse ideas, diverse energies, and things along those lines. So, anyways, that's the very tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. But that mm -hmm. would be the starting place is 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 with the with the audition. Uh, Honoring the orchestra as sort of a communal music making space, as opposed to looking at it like a machine where you just swap parts in and out. Um, totally, that's what I'm hearing. So as we as we as we head towards the top of the hour, I'd love to uh, bring us back uh, to gateways a little bit, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know what really excites you um, about this festival, and maybe we could do that through the lens of the program. Uh, recognizing that we actually have one of our uh, composer arrangers on the call, I see uh, Mr. Cockerum here with us. But if you could, if you could, if you were interested, and if you're not, then you can just answer, a make up a question and answer that question. But I was wondering if you could talk about, like, you know, with the Brahms, what excites you about that, and um, with uh, Florence Price, you know, what just what are the thoughts and um, the, the maybe a little nuggets of uh, what is exciting you about this opportunity? at Carnegie Hall conducting the Gateways Festival Orchestra? Well, I knew George Walker very well, and I, I knew him for about 25 years. Um, you know, I will say that um, when George talked about his own music, uh, the, the work that we're performing, 
uh, you know, especially his symphonias, which all kind of uh, have a particular aesthetic, but this is the core of what he would consider his repertoire to be. Of course, Lyric for Strings is the first thing that a lot of orchestras dance out and perform, but he actually is, is uh, frustrated by that because he feels it's kind of like, you know, Ravel with Bolero. Everybody does Bolero, but, you know, Ravel absolutely hated because he, was, he didn't feel that that piece was representative of his output. But, you know, but the Symphonia number no. three really is indicative of a lot of what um, went on in, in George Walker's mind. The, the unfortunate thing is, is that George when you listen to Symphonia Number no. Three from a technical and from a musical perspective, it's quite terse and turbulent. However, if you listen, in most of the most of the recordings, um, people are playing it in a rather austere fashion. And Stravinsky's kind of struggled with this as well. A lot of Stravinsky's output that was a little bit more uh, harmonically adventurous, uh, people performed it with kind of an austere and cold uh, sensibility. But uh, George Walker actually would prefer for his music to be performed with the same warmth that we would apply to Brahms or Tchaikovsky. Mm. So I, lo I look forward to, um, and, and that is a whole different, you know, I, I think that's, you, you'll get a lot closer to what was in his mind. I mean, and he really is one of the m most brilliant minds and pianists of the 20th and 21st century, quite frankly. And then you have the third symphony by, uh, by Florence Price. Um, and while there are some good uh, recordings out there, they're not conducted by conductors, in my opinion, or by musicians that have any, uh, that are close to the source material. Mm -hmm. You know, Florence Price's work that has to, you have to really take her work and work it. You know, um, if you perform exactly what's on the page, it, it will be a dry experience, but you have to actually understand what it is to be a woman from Little Rock, Arkansas, and understand the aesthetics of, of growing up uh, in that particular uh, culture to have any, under I mean, because we have to we have to understand a lot of things about Beethoven's life and, and Brahms' life and the sensibilities and the aesthetics of that time. But I wonder what, how much depth has been done to understand our culture uh, that's wrapped in, you know, so it's not just by performing the notes on the page because most of what, uh, uh, most of the music in Florence Price's compositions is in the musicians. And, you know, so I think that we will really speak powerfully to, to, to bring, uh, her work to life and of course the brahms is uh you know the brahms is something that everybody can grasp that's a piece that's quite well known um but another piece that is quite mm -hmm. difficult to make sense of you know um uh i think the brahms quite personally the best iteration of brahms uh, variations is the two piano version because that's where you have the most flexibility um oftentimes the brahms variations can be quite dry because you know even if you give an apt performance of it uh, without a real sense of flow and, 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 uh, and, and rubato and sensitivity and sensitivity. It's, it's, it's a, so it's a really challenging program top to bottom. And of course we have, we're, we're breathing life into a piece that we haven't even seen yet uh, with mm -hmm. John Batiste's uh, work. Um, and then of course we're ending with, uh, with lift every voice and sing. And uh, that was something that was drilled drilled into me at you know Bank Street Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. You know, mm -hmm. and all the verses, you know, not just <laughs> we had to have all those verses memorized. Um, so, anyways, uh, yeah. So it's it's a it's a really daunting program, I think. Um, mm -hmm. On the surface, maybe not so much, but the uh, the musicianship that it will take uh, for I think this particular program to have any meaning uh, is going to really require. Uh, everyone's utmost, and I'm looking forward to uh, to really digging into that. Yeah, well, let me say on behalf of myself, and, and I think everyone on this call, and uh, and I feel confident speaking for my musician colleagues who aren't here, we feel the same way. Everyone, the, the excitement is really growing. We're really looking forward to this. We're looking forward, of course, also to honoring the memory and legacy of Maestro Morgan at every turn, um, and honoring him with the the spirit and the commitment that we we bring to all this anything it's been such a pleasure for me personally just getting to spend some more time uh chopping it up with you um i want to thank you for taking this time to share with our guests 
Um, I want to uh, now turn it back over to Lee to say a few closing words. And I think if we, we, we actually can be completely respectful of everyone's time and uh, end at the top of the hour. So Lee, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex um, and Anthony, for your terrific conversation. It was great to be fly on the wall and listen to you guys talk. So thank you very, very much. Um, this has been a really an extraordinary evening, and it's, it's making me even more excited, if that's possible, um, about our upcoming festival. So I wanted to remind everybody, um, before we conclude the evening, um, that we begin on Monday, April the 18th, um, with our piano recital. And then the very next day, on Tuesday the 19th, is a lecture, and it is about the music of Florence Price, um, and it's about the Black idioms in the music of Florence Price, and specifically that third um, symphony that the orchestra will be playing. So that really um, will be extraordinary uh, lecture with Corey Hunter. But to, to hear about all of the things that um, we'll be presenting in the week um, of the festival, please go to our website. We're at gatewaysmusicfestival.org um, and you'll see the entire schedule there. Um, tickets are really selling amazingly well in Rochester and in New York City. As I mentioned, the Carnegie Hall performance is sold out now which is unfortunate because there are so many people who wanna be a part of that event, but um, there are, are no tickets at this point. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you again to all of you. Thank you to Anthony, thank you to Alex um, and have a wonderful evening. I look forward to seeing all of you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.